Today's episode is sponsored by Zondervan Publishers. Zondervan is offering a Bible study put together by Pastor Spence Shelton called Trace the Themes. It can help you trace the themes of Scripture as they unfold from Genesis to Revelation. This is a free six-part study that's perfect for small groups, family devotions, or individual use, and it includes videos and downloadable study guides. You can start your free Bible study today by visiting tracethethemes.com. Welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, a podcast exploring Christian faith and practice from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne. I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois. And I'm Jimmy Fowler, executive pastor at Redeemer Fellowship. How you feeling, boo-boo? Ah, uh, a little bit better today. Thank you for asking. What, what happened? I don't know what happened, dude. I went down for the count. So I yesterday, down. I was I was a zombie. It's Memorial Day. Is that what it is? Those Labor the Day. Labor Day. I don't, I don't pay Day. attention. I don't care. <clears throat> so it's 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 whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Labor Day, yep. and uh, so we're we're recording because yep. you know we got some time. That's right. But yesterday on Sunday, mm. you looked a little rough. I I felt rough. I felt rough. Just hit me. I don't know. So what you it did was. a wedding before that. I did a wedding on Saturday, which it was hot, but that wasn't it. I was already starting to feel it on. Saturday, but mm. no, it really hit me on Sunday. You think, you think there's like some... Some cold, something like that. Mm, maybe God's trying to teach you something. What's he trying to teach me? I wouldn't know, man. I could, I can't teach you. Can, please help discern. Take the divine being yeah, to teach you. Help, help me discern I'm gonna what it guess, is that God's though, I'm going to guess, though. Listen, I, all I know is that oh, is in, Corinthians, any, in Corinthians, I, in Corinthians mm-hmm. some of them got sick uh, because they were being jerk faces. And I'm wondering maybe if, what way if, your was jerkitude, I, if your jerkitude is reaching like your maximum potential, you uh, know? By maximum potential? Yeah, maximum jerkitude? potential. Maxwell potential? Yeah. Well, speaking of Maxwell, we have a guest with us today, don't we? Not just a guest. A friend. A very good friend. There we go. Somebody that uh, that we've known now for a few years mm-hmm. and uh, somebody that we're very close to, even though he abandoned us and lives and in, left. A, yeah, lives in a redneck mullet state. <laughs> Thanks for leaving uh, us, Paul. Yeah, uh, what are you going to do? Yeah, uh, well, not leave. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you could have did. Yeah, right. That's what we did. We stayed. Yeah, exactly. yeah that's what we did. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to leave. Um, so, Paul, if you guys don't know Paul, Paul is a philosopher. He's a writer. Uh, he's, a, he's a very good friend of ours. A lot of you will know him through his writing at Desiring God. Yep. A lot of you know him through Theofit. Mm-hmm. Some of you just know him through this podcast because we love us and Paul Maxwell and we talk about him a fair All bit, the time, yeah. Right? All so the time. He comes up and, oh, actually, And Paul, his tiny shirts. Well, listen, I have, we have a gift. We, <laughs> we, have, have, we do we, have a gift we, for we you. We have a gift for you. Uh, yep. so we, hold on, hold on. Let's start right. right there. The weather is changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the weather is changing. We thought you might want. We thought you might want like a... Like a like a, something like a like a, a is it, hoodie. Is this an XXXL? It's, it's, it's here. Look, this is your, <laughs> that, that, that just size right there. <laughs> there. We thought we know you like your shirts oh, to be fitted. We could say. Oh, this is awesome. And I think that's you know. Is that is that, it? Is that X X? Should I put this on? You, Extra I think small? you should put it on. We'll yeah, take put a it picture. on right now. Here we go. go. All, right, all right, here we go. I'm here putting go. this on. This this <laughs> child's medium old navy sweatshirt. Yeah. They're stretchy. Should I just put it on? Yeah, I think you put it on. Okay, put all right, all here it goes. I'm going to go full. Now, Paul, if you haven't seen Paul before. Is that Catherine's? Did you just take No, Catherine's? no, no, but it, it might be uh. one of my sons. <laughs> all right, let me get a picture of this That's here. That's a perfect There we go. There we go. <laughs> Got it. All right, so uh, you guys can see that in the show notes. Oh, Paul, all right, yeah, you can take it off. We, we give Paul a hard time uh, no, because he's he's jacked like Superman. He's like a really muscular guy. He's jacked like Superman, but it's got the style of Luther. Oh, Ooh, wow. See, how'd you like that? that? High five. Oh, no, that's great. Oh, that's Le- you mean Lex uh, Luthor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We said Luther. Like, Luther. He like, got like, it. Like, like Martin you just, Luther. Uh, listen, you don't get it. Right. You don't get it. It's I, okay, Luther Joe. Vandross. I, I was confused. You said Luther. <laughs> he understood. Lex, you should say Lex Luthor. Context is everything. Okay. Yeah, because he's bald. He does look like... Exactly. Like, Context. So, uh, but Paul is—he's—he's he's not uh, a fitness guy, as in my opinion, as much as he is a, a health guy and a lifestyle guy. I mean, when he when he talks about those things, that's he, it's much broader and deeper than just mm-hmm. fitness. So, anyways, Paul, um, that's that's a little bit about Paul. And we could talk about anything with Paul, though. We could talk about healthy lifestyle, philosophy, we theology. About, yeah, theology. But I think today we want to focus on masculinity. Mm. We do, we do. And before we get into that, we'd like to know, like, what. What is, what are you doing right now? What are you, what are you really passionate about? What are you excited about? Maybe that some people don't know what's, don't know about that are listening to the podcast mm-hmm. right now. It's a great question. I appreciate you guys having me on. I'm a big fan of the podcast, and uh, of course you are. Uh, I know, of course, who isn't, right? I, uh, 
I Jared recently, Wilson. yeah, <laughs> Jared, oh, poor Jared. Uh, recently graduated with my PhD in systematic theology um, from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Mm. That was great. And what um, was that in? Uh, uh, that was in systematic theology, and my I, I wrote my dissertation on the relationship between reformed theology and PTSD, great. Uh, particularly the way that abused boys, the psychology of men who were abused as boys, inter- internalized reformed theology as they mm. become adults. Okay. Mm. And I was, it's, it, it's not necessarily critical of Reformed theology, and it's not necessarily trying to defend Reformed theology in any way. It's just sort of getting a right. lay of the land. What yeah. are the sort of psychodynamics here? And, um, and a lot of that was just sort of me giving a theological account of my own experience within the Reformed world and with God and sort of, and some themes that we'll get into, kind of making my faith and my relationship with God my own. Yeah. And, cool. um, and so that was great. It was a great experience and I'm very glad to be done now. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, just got married a year ago. Which Molly. Was oh yeah. Huge. Yeah. Molly. She's amazing. Hugely blessed. Um, I'm she, just, she looks like she's more fun than you. So much more fun. Oh my oh, gosh. Yeah. We have the exact opposite. When she's around <laughs> people, she just brightens people up. They just open up to her. She has this spiritual gift. For I feel like you tear opposite. me down. I repel people <laughs> I, like, like, you know, those happy go lucky people that will just come up to you and talk to you and be like, Hey brother. Like, oh, those I, are annoying. Yeah. People. I feel like they see my face and they're like, I'm just not going to try. Yeah, not don't do that. Do it. Yeah, and I don't even mean to. It's like you talk about the rest, resting Baptist face. I try yeah. to I try mm-hmm. to smile a little bit more. But sometimes you get to a point where you're like, you're so used to having that rest, resting face, mm-hmm. that resting angry face where you, you smile and you kind of feel like, do I look like the Joker right now? Well, I, the like, thing, when it, you smile, look like you look creep- like the Joker. You like, go yeah, from like, Luther yeah. to the Joker. It looks oh, like a, there you go. It's like a Joe. creepy smile, you know? So so anyway, so... There it is. Yeah, There's that creepy smile. It's like a serial uh, killer uh, smile, uh, especially when you're bald too. You got to be really careful when you smile. Yeah, it looks yeah. creepy, especially around like little kids and stuff. Yeah, yeah which I try to do less. They and get less scared. Less. Yeah, they get super they scared. They get super scared. <laughs> and so, uh, so that's been awesome. Um, I've had Theofit, which um, anybody who's been working with Theofit knows. I've been like trying to be consistent with Theofit. Mm. The thing is, uh, I kind of thought it would maybe turn into a full time thing. Didn't. So I just do it sort of as a th- uh, side thing now. And uh, it's doing well. I do personal training down in Indianapolis, oh, nice. which is great. Yeah, I just have a couple people, and I do some online personal physical training, uh, people trying to get in shape, get healthy, mm-hmm. stuff like that. But the main thing I do right now is um, I actually have a, a business partner that's allowed me to work full-time on this website called selfwired.org because I love Theofit. I love doing fitness stuff. It's a big part of my life. Um, but my big passion right now is trying to – um, ask questions and write articles and resources on theology, philosophy, psychology, and politics. Because I'm looking at this world that we're living in right. uh, uh, from a biblical perspective, mm-hmm. from uh, sort of coming from the evangelical world, looking at this Ben Shapiro, leftist, you know, uh, perspective, Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, intellectual dark web. Um, evangelicalism has its own crisis kind of on the one hand, you know, a lot of evangelicals supporting Trump. On the other hand, a lot of evangelicals kind of maybe forming this alliance with more leftist, liberal, yeah. social justice stuff. And I'm thinking, where is all this going? Right, right. What are the theological themes here? What are the biblical themes here? What's the church's witness supposed to be in this time? So selfwire.org is kind of my best attempt to figure all of that out and to provide resources interacting with a lot of the uh, original ideas that inform these movements that are going on in the world. So I'm going to be interacting a lot with psychology, a lot yeah. with political theory, yeah. a lot with theology, because a lot of the resources that are being created to help people think through these things don't actually elevate their um, level of understanding to where it needs to be in order to engage these realities. So for example, I was sort of inspired by listening to Ben Shapiro. Mm-hmm. He'll go on the one hand, sort of uh, expositing certain legal cases yeah, right, yeah. with his Harvard Law background. On the other hand, he'll give a delineation of the ontological argument for God and Thomas Aquinas. He'll be drawing from Moses Maimonides. He'll be doing exegesis of Greek and Hebrew. And I'm thinking, yeah. that's great. And I actually, sorry, I'm kind of... Uh, no, do no, your thing. Do your thing. But I remember watching Jordan Peterson on the Joe Rogan Experience the other day. And uh, he was expositing some verse in Matthew in his like Jordan Peterson-esque type way, right, which right. is like basically kind of this nihilist Nietzschean thing or whatever. But But basically he was like, Joe... I found this great uh, resource for studying and understanding the Bible. It really opens up, helps you understand the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. It's called 
Bible Gateway. And I was like, <laughs> I was like awesome. listen, if Jordan Peterson can change the world with Bible Gateway, mm-hmm. what yeah. should we be able to do right. with PhDs in theology? We know Greek and Hebrew. Right. Yeah, we yeah. know church history. I'm like, we need to do better. So self-wire. And I think it's kind of interesting how the intellectual dark web doesn't really have an evangelical member in it right now. There's right. not yeah. really an evangelical yeah. voice speaking into that. We have uh, we have atheist, we have Jewish, yep, we atheist. have Rogan. Well, he's right. not really he's not, well, Rogan's not in the intellectual dark. Group. He's just right. like a facilitator. He, yes, of it. right, right, right. But by the way, before we get into this, really yeah. briefly, can you just explain? Because I'm sure half at least of our people have no idea what you mean by intellectual dark web. Oh, and maybe, yes. and maybe so one out of two people here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the intellectual dark web is just a collection of public thinkers who are um, devoted to free speech and. Uh, uh, sort of cut against the grain of the politically correct culture mm-hmm. and are interested in engaging with science and philosophical ideas uh, in a way that is expressive of individual rights and in American democracy. And you have right now in, in political discourse this tension between, on the one hand, uh, let's say more of a Marxist-leaning, well, you know, democratic socialism yeah, yeah, right. that cares more about group identity mm-hmm. and national identity. And, and and then on the other hand, you have a more originalist, conservative, individual-oriented, that uh, individual-oriented perspective uh, among these intellectual dark web members who are trying to understand uh, uh, religion and the political climate mm-hmm. and uh, uh, a, what it means to be a responsible person in the world right now in a way that kind of cuts against the grain of some of the politically correct right. culture that requires us to talk about masculinity in certain ways, femininity in certain ways. Right, they right. create these arbitrary rules for how we're supposed to relate to one another, how we're supposed to relate to the government, what political opinions we're allowed to have. And essentially, free speech, as Jordan Peterson might say, who's a member of the intellectual dark web, free speech is the manifestation of f- our belief in free will. And I don't mean that in a Calvinist sense, yeah, just yeah. in the sense that we yeah. have responsibility, we have free choice. And and ultimately, we are responsible to use those words wisely because we have individual responsibility. We're not speaking on behalf of a group. We're not speaking on behalf of other people. We're speaking on behalf of ourselves. Whereas a, a sort of a leftist perspective might look at Jordan Peterson and say, no, you're speaking as a white man. You're speaking as a, a male. What you're saying is representative more of your group identity than it is your individual identity. So I say, that's sort of the intellect. That's what the intellectual dark web is. It's kind of a, a public group of intellectuals that re- that 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 represents maybe a counter to a leftist culture, mm. which is more focused on group identity. So I, philosophically, I think, have very little in common, right? On, yeah. on that like foundational level of a great or point. particular ideology. You've got Rogan, who's high. Well, he right, Rogan's yeah. not in it. I keep going back to Rogan. He's not in it. He's a facilitator, I guess, yeah. for a lot of those guys. But you've got, you know, you've got conservative and you've got liberal. And right. You've got yeah. You've got and everything. You've else. got an Orthodox Jew. You've got a Harvard psychologist. You've got a, uh, 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 you know, I think Jocko Willink's kind of in there. So you've got this ex Navy SEAL. You've got this, you know, jujitsu black belt. You've got this MIT mathematician, mm-hmm. and they all believe different things about religion. They all, you know, Sam Harris, who's the yeah. atheist. They all believe different things about religion and politics. They're on the political left. They're on the political right. But they all believe in free speech and individual rights and that's the one thing that sort of politically correct cultures count against and what i like about that is this okay we are going to engage in free inquiry unencumbered Mm -hmm. by our political obligation to a particular party unencumbered by our in uh, monetary incentivization we might take from taking a particular view they say no let's hash this out let's talk this out let's figure these things out and I, i really like that and that's kind of what i want to do theologically which I think hasn't really been done too much in the evangelical world because we're we're Baptists, we're Presbyterians, we're evangelicals, but we need to sort of crack open these deeper questions at the heart of theology and at the heart of masculinity that doesn't quite fit with putting everything in a nice picture. Um, and and I think that that I think evangelicalism will benefit from that. And well, that's you, good. You guys kind of do that too. Yeah, we call ourselves the theological dark web, right? Right. Because that's the what the evangelicals yes. do. We just steal Indeed. other people's uh, <laughs> ideas and words and, and baptize them so that they're all right. So let's get into this. We know that people oh, yeah. really want to talk about it about this issue of masculinity. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, Paul, I mean, what? Why is masculinity and femininity? Why are these such a hot topic issue at the moment? Yeah. Um, well, one of the reasons is because of this theme that we've noted already. It's it's that um, in a liberal perspective, uh, men speak as men and not mm-hmm. as individuals and women speak on behalf of it's a female perspective when you're talking, not your perspective. And you just happen to be a woman. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
And so on the one hand, this group think where we identify people more with their groups than with their individuality, it requires us to now utilize these terms male and female in really serious ways that we haven't had to utilize them before. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. Another thing, and uh, this has more to do with why uh, defining masculinity or really understanding getting a, a grip on masculinity is important, is that um, <clears throat> there is a real crisis in masculinity right now that has to do with the death rate among men and the top two uh, reasons that uh, men between the ages of, I think it is 15 and 45 pass away are number two is suicide. Mm. Number one is, uh, 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 is poison, which, <sighs> which in that category is opioid overdoses. Okay. Gotcha. And okay. so, and so if you, cla if you group together those opioid overdose, unintentional opioid overdoses by men and those suicides, essentially the, the way that I see it is the number one killer of young men to middle-aged men is psychological pain. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that has to do with a sense of being alone, a sense of not understanding yourself, your identity, mm -hmm. your position in the world. And really that all contributes to this isolation that produces a desperation. And uh, so, for example, I don't know, maybe you guys can cut this out later. I, I, I don't know uh, if you want, but we don't but, cut stuff. Out yeah, we don't that. cut stuff. Out, but, but, you know, two, two cases in particular are um, one was uh, the, there's a recent California pastor who, who mm -hmm. uh, killed himself. And his wife posted a really heartfelt blog where she said maybe six or seven times that, you know, really sorry how alone you felt. Really sorry that mm -hmm. you felt so isolated, that you couldn't talk to anybody, how hurt you were and betrayed. And there's this real theme of loneliness and being alone. And the same thing for, I think it was a couple of years ago when the Ashley Madison stuff broke, the yeah. New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary professor who also committed suicide and his, his wife also commented to the Washington Post that she believes the, the, the fact, the determining factor of this tragedy was that his, his sense of being alone in evangelical culture, that he couldn't speak to other men about his weaknesses, that he couldn't sort of, uh, you know, there, there were certain things that he couldn't do because it would have, you know, threatened his position as a man mm. uh, in, in the culture in which he was invested. And so, so I think that understanding, not just understanding uh, what masculinity is, but develop, but but understanding it and developing practices which cultivate its healthfulness for the most amount of men uh, to really address this crisis issue is is very important for us. So so it's 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 a hot political issue right now, but it's also sociologically a a, a, a public health problem. Yeah. And so conceptually, we need to really get our arms around this. We're going to get to your definition, which I think is so helpful in in a, in a little bit. But but you you talked about this this idea of you know, men feeling alone, mm -hmm. um, isolated, isolated, not being able to talk to other men about their struggles or their weaknesses. So that's sort of in my mind is getting back to how we're getting it wrong. When we talk about masculinity, what it means to be a man, how are we as Christians getting it wrong? Mm -hmm. And, and, and how are or maybe even more broadly, how are people in, in general getting this wrong? Yeah, I think that there are, there are a few things that are contributing to this sense of aloneness. I think that the first is just the rhetoric that we use um, uh, approaching men. So, so this. Like what are some examples of what do you mean? Some the rhetoric. Yeah. So, for example, like when, well, I have a. There are a couple of issues that contribute to this crisis, and let's just call this the issue of relational credibility. And okay. the one example that I might use is an example of like, I've been really helped by Matt Chandler and his ministry and his mm -hmm. preaching. Uh, but when he's on stage uh -oh. yelling at a bunch of uh -oh. uh, boys who can shave, you know, because they're just getting their stuff together, they're figuring it out. And all of a sudden he's heaping this condemnation on them. I think that that's um, that can be very unhelpful. And that that sort of for me, that that serves to frame the bigger issue of how mm. we're failing in our understanding of masculinity and how we're failing men in, in, in this way, that there are essentially two memes of a way to approach men. One is this hyper masculine sort of Chandler esque, um, very Driscoll in before yes, Chandler. It was Driscoll, Driscoll, yeah. yeah, before Chandler it was Driscoll, and and it was this it was this notion that we're doubling down on one or two masculine qualities, and we're grading everybody on that scale, mm -hmm. and you it's it's pass fail, and you're either a man or you're not a man, 
And it's this this fixed mindset. This uh, the Stanford researcher Carol, Carol Dweck in her book Fixed Mindset or in, in her book Mindset talks about this notion of a fixed mindset. And you either are or you're not. And then if you're not, well, then you have to do all this work to hopefully qualify for this category. And then, well, maybe I can be a man then. And there's a place for that, which I'm going to get to in a second. But there's this one meme where in that category, I would also put bro culture, machismo mm. culture, yeah. where ultimately the problem with these things is they're not talking about bad value, va- values, right? Because Chandler wants men to take responsibility. Even bro culture points towards, well, physical strength and even sexual prowess, in, which even in a, in a limited sense, which is the, the ability to be a suitor, yeah. right, is a good thing. So yeah, they're yeah. highlighting good values. The problem is that they narrow masculinity to a single the f- mm. single quality and then the, well it's pass fail on that quality and that that's you're right. either a man or you're not uh and <coughs> and so that's one meme the opposite meme is this sort of leftist like oh you can't tell a man that he's not a man, man masculinity is like sensitivity man you know it's like being sensitive and being good with kids that's masculinity too mm. and then but if you ask that person like okay what is masculinity and and tell me how it's not femininity it's like um I don't really know. I just know guys need to be sensitive. It's like, okay, yeah, that's kind of the other leftist meme Mm -hmm. where at the end of the day, it's like, well, yeah, we want men to be sensitive and toxic masculinity is a real problem. But at the end of the day, when you ask them, well, what is good about masculinity? What can you, how can you define masculinity in a way that celebrates what's good? There's, well, I don't know. I just know there's a problem that needs to be fixed. It's Mm -hmm. like, yeah, there's no problem there. And in the middle, there needs to be something that celebrates a diversity of masculine qualities that at the same time can define it and yet establish practices which can handle imperfection and Mm. can handle failure, but at the same time catalyze growth and inspire growth and push men towards an ideal. Mm. Something that would also embrace like cultural diversity and, you know, eras and uh, and, and all of that. Yeah, cultural diversity across the globe, psychological diversity Mm. between men. You know, certain guys have different uh, uh, dispositions. And that's the problem when you, it's easy to really go with one of these memes or the other right so you have somebody who starts sort of getting on this sermonic monologue about like yeah you know guys really do, they need to own up they need to step it up and, and mean, meanwhile you've got this guy in the corner of the room who's just really struggling yeah and he's just getting feeling more and more psychologically marginalized it's like mm. well yeah you don't necessarily want that but on the other hand you don't want to capitulate your whole definition of masculinity to that guy right. and say yeah. hey man it's okay you don't have to change you don't have to do anything it's like no how do we call him mm to a higher standard without crushing him. Yeah, that's right. That's that's really difficult. And I think there are a lot of variables that come into that, some of those being community, authority, credibility. And I mm-hmm. think that leads to, so we just talked about relational credibility, but here's another thing, which is uh, really professional credibility, right? Mm-hmm. So in evangelicalism, who teaches us about how to be men? They're all old guys with theology PhDs. Okay, that's fine. I can learn from John Piper about masculinity. I can learn from Tim Keller about masculinity, right? Or, mm. you know. Or I can learn from... Jofo. Or, yeah, oh, or yeah, Jofo, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously. And, and, you should have started with and, that yeah, one yeah, first. Yeah, of course. And that actually gets into the, the final thing that I want to talk about. But, but before I get to that, I want to say that, you know, but if I have to choose who I'm really going to take my cue from, mm-hmm. I'm going to take it from somebody who walks the walk. I'm going to take it from somebody I can look at and say, yeah, I really want to be like that guy. And honestly... With all due respect to John Piper, because the guy's a, a boss, right? He's like mm-hmm. a phenom. He's on another level. But if I have to learn about masculinity from somebody, I'm probably going to choose Joe Rogan or Jocko, Jocko Willing, yeah. you know, or one of these other guys who are really badass who I can say, okay, I really want to be like that guy and I'm going to imitate him, mm-hmm. which leads us to, I think, so that's the problem. So that's an issue of professional credibility or, or authority, really. But this leads into this, this, this issue of paternal credibility which is this third issue. And this is something that I think you guys do really well. So, so Freud, uh, he, he has a lot of wacky ideas, but one idea I think is really good. He has this, this book called Totem and Taboo. And the totem is the sacred, and the taboo is the transgression, mm-hmm. right? And evangelicals are really good at the sacred. They're really good at the order. They're really good at pursuing the ideal. Problem is masculinity is both. And you need leaders. Not, by transgressive, I don't mean sin. You don't need leaders who are going to teach you how to sin, but they need, you need leaders who are willing to transgress the cultural norms mm. for the sake of the ideal. So I get it, Paul. We're the taboo. You have the taboo. We are yeah, the yeah, taboo yeah. in this well, situation. Well, what, I just do what he was getting at here. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's the thing is you need, you need leaders, you need fathers who are willing to push you to something higher, but also this is the thing. You, leaders, fathers, 
who 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 I think is is uh, who are a critical component of why masculinity is in crisis right now. They need to be able to put down their egos and put down their insecurities and really lead by example in struggle. Mm -hmm. So like this morning, I was working out with um, one of my professors from Trinity who's been this for me, Con Campbell, and we worked out together and he teaches me new things every time we work out and I see him sweat. And that I think is just kind of by analogy applies Mm. to all leadership is young men want to see somebody that they can see them sweat and they can see them push through difficulty and they can see them push against their own limits and say, this is how you push through and see guys say, you know what? This is how I fail. And this is how I get back up again. Yeah, Not, yeah. I don't fall. Mm. I don't fail. Right. Because there is this myth that leaders just cannot fail. And I think you see this in evangelicalism where it's like, Hey, this celebrity pastor's fired. Hey, this celebrity pastor's fired. Hey, this guy's out. That guy's out. It's, it's like, month. what happened? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What happened? And it's like, well, okay. A, there's no, there is no community that exists that allows them to be morally imperfect, which perpetuates the secrecy of the mm-hmm. sin. Yeah, of course. Right. And second, when you, other guys who aren't in those leadership positions see these guys in leadership positions getting fired for X, Y, Z, it's not like they're murderers, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they, you know, it's just like for moral imperfection. It's like okay, and and I don't want to nullify that. You know, pastors are have a higher moral calling, as Paul obviously talks about. But but at the same time, how do we balance that with Okay, we're giving cues to younger men that moral imperfection re- requires exile. Yeah, it requires and therefore demolition. Yeah, it, it, because you will be morally imperfect. You better shut your mouth. Yeah, and right. Not talk to anybody. And the, yeah, before before we go on, um, I want I want to uh, give props to uh, our sponsor. For, oh yeah, uh, for this episode, Zondervan. Zondervan, and so I mean they're offering that trace the themes. Free bu- Bible study. Or bubble study. Bubble study. You know, it's either a bubble whatever. or a Bible study. That Don't will do help. your Bible study in a bubble. You know, do it with other people. And to do it with other people, you can use this Trace the Themes <laughs> Bible study. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for that, uh, for fixing my mix up. Your what? My you're, mix you're Mexican? Up. What no, did you say? I did not say that. You I said did. Mix up. Oh, mix up. Okay. My mix up. Anyways, the free Bible study that will help you trace biblical themes as they are progressively revealed in Scripture. So we want to ask you the question. Are you tired of Bible studies that just pick a verse here or there without much rhyme or reason? Joe, yep, I, I don't want? like that. I don't like that. I ain't got oh. time for that. Ain't nobody got time for okay, that. How about this one, Joe? Did you ever wish you could learn how to look at a theme and let the Bible speak on its own reason? <sighs> Every day. Oh, goodness. Or this is what this Bible study is going to do for you, Joe. Really? Yeah, it's all right. Because I'm, I'm down. We lo- we use this. We use Bible studies all the time. We we like to equip our small group leaders. Like mm-hmm. get in on this. Our D- our DGs, our discipleship groups. That's right. We love to give them resources. That they can go. This sounds like one of those resources. And you know what? This study will help. It's got. It helps you. Uh, it gives you six studies. Six how, how much? How much? Because like people people are going broke here. Buying what do you mean? People are going. It's yeah. free. This is free. This is free. Right, you get cool, it for then. free by going to trace the themes dot. Com. It's perfect for small groups, personal study, family devotions, whatever else. Awesome. That sounds great. All right. So, Paul, get, getting back to this issue of, of masculinity, you actually um, you <laughs> you wrote an article, which is uh, one of my favorite. It, it, in fact, it is my favorite thing that I've read on masculinity. I'll just mm. be honest with you. That's in fact, we were talking months ago about masculinity, and I was I was expressing to you like like I'm frustrated because. You know, half of the time when I hear guys talk about masculinity from a Christian perspective, it could all apply to women too. Right. So it's like, well, that, how is that uniquely masculine? Or it's purely cultural, um, or or it's just unclear, it's vague, like, mm-hmm. or, or it's good, but it's only touching on one part of it. And you dropped a definition of masculinity on me that I had never heard before, would never have occurred to me before. Mm. It was really, really helpful. And that is reflected. You then wrote this article, The Crisis of Masculinity in a Postmodern Age. Um, you know, th- that article, listen, okay, for the guys that are going to go read it. And we're going to link to it. Yeah, we're, we're going to it's, it. it's It's not a Desiring God article. No. no uh, we love DG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is, this is a philosophical thoughtful com- it's a complex article because oh, yeah. the issue is complex i love that you treat it as a complex issue it's not a simple issue right. no and so you you it is complex but you bring clarity to it and your definition is just it it's short but it is deep oh yeah i mean in the end you define masculinity as uh, masculinity is a man's maximization of his potential for competence in the domain of his maleness manliness and manhood mm. that to me is a complete that's a complete package right there but it's 
I can't believe it says as much as it says in that short of a sentence because <laughs> I tried to repeat it to people that the first time you said to me, and I had to email you a couple like, wait, wait, give me the definition again. I can't remember it because it, it's so short, but it, it's so densely packed. And so we really want you to unpack this for us. Mm-hmm. So uh, as we're sending people to this article, you know, some of our people, like they're, you know, uh, you know they're not PhDs. Some of our people aren't PhDs. No, so some, they, of them, they, some of them are at the Joe Thorne level. <laughs> some, of them, right, right. some of us are, you know, we need some training wheels uh, to navigate this, <laughs> this philosophical bicycle through the neighborhood. Right. So give or us... Or tricycle for us. So, yeah, that's for us. <laughs> I'm in the wagon uh, and Jimmy's pulling the wagon. Uh, that's really what it is because I, I can't do it. Uh, so can you unpack that for us? Yeah. So first, let me just make a distinction between the philosophies that I think undergird what I was talking about earlier as those two memes, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Sort of that Chandler-esque machismo meme that narrows it down to one thing. And also the sort of the leftist meme that says, well, masculinity isn't really anything that kind of effeminizes masculinity. So these two philosophies that undergird them is, and you know, it's probably not, there's not a strict application here, but I essentially say that leftism or that, that sort of effeminate approach to masculinity it has a postmodern uh, uh, undercurrent. And what I mean by that is they're sensitive to the diversity of each individual yeah. relative to the other. So they want to take account for, well, you're not me. You're just imposing your own definition of masculinity on me. It's like, okay, right, I get it. You're sensitive to the fact that people are different, yeah. right? So we have to take into account that sensitivity. Problem is when people follow that road, they tend to want to deconstruct the idea that there's any th- such thing as masculinity. Yeah. And on the other hand, you have an objectivist or a, what I call a realist perspective on masculinity, which these are people who want to say, this is what masculinity is. Mm. This is what it is. This is what it isn't. Yeah. And the thing is, we need a definition that can accommodate the fact that men are different and also the fact that we're all men mm-hmm. and there's something mm-hmm. that unifies all of us. And so that's why I think that ultimately masculinity has to distinguish between maleness, manliness and manhood. Mm. Now, this is how I define that. People people use those terms pretty interchangeably, I they feel do, like. They do, right? right? And I kind of made up the definitions that constitute these things. That's here. all right. You can do that. Right. Yeah, yeah. you're allowed to. You're allowed to. Yeah, sure, sure, right. Yeah, exactly, right. I'm a PhD now. I can yeah, do whatever you can I want. do whatever you want. <laughs> say whatever I want. So, whatever you want to do, Dr. Paul. <laughs> there you go. That's right. I'll take it. And so, so I define maleness as, uh, essentially, it's that, well, what, what scientists call the genotype. It's your biological maleness. It's mm. sort of that irrefutable thing that, okay... I know even this is getting called into question. Right. Yeah, right. But, so, yeah, you're but, about to... but on the other hand, you know, sort of clear thinking, common sense assumption here that we're going to make is that, yes, we can distinguish between men and women. And there are certain distinguishing features which result from this genealogical distinction that we make between male and female. Like men tend to have 50% more muscle mass, higher testosterone levels, and this has certain psychological consequences. Likewise, you know, the role that men play in reproduction is different than the role f- women mm-hmm. play in reproduction. I'll take this into account down the road. So that's called the genotype. Your male genotype is different from the female genotype. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, manliness is then the cultural outworkings of those differences of genotype. Okay. So scientists call this a phenotype, right? And this is really, uh, this comes from the Greek, you know, Greek word phenos and typos, which just means like it's a shared typology. Mm-hmm. It's a shared group uh uh uh, is a a shared common cluster of traits that this group of male genotypes share Mm. and these manliness uh so so male oh oh, so you know what actually let me let me just backtrack a little bit um so so masculinity is a man's maximization of his potential for competence in the domains of maleness uh manliness and manhood right Mm -hmm. so competence then Competence is the foundational content here that we're really talking about when you talk about masculinity. So competence refers to your ability to overcome obstacles in the pursuit of a particular goal compared to other men pursuing that goal. So you are competent to the degree that you can ascend to the top of that competence hierarchy or that dominance hierarchy to the degree that you can be the very best, the most Mm -hmm. skilled. So male skills or genotypical skills would be things like brute physical skills like strength right or basically that strength your ability to like do basic physical tasks or things like that uh manliness skills is your ability to uh compile those skills of maleness into a more complex game so for example maybe you would be able to transform a physical strength into a fighting skill 
right? Mm. In competition with another male. This would be a manliness skill. This would be a manliness sort of competence where you elevate it to you sort of upgrade it to 2.0, level level two. Yeah, yeah. And now we're not talking about just physical competencies, but cultural competencies and relational competencies. And you're bringing this into the society in which you're in to the degree that you can excel in those games. So that's manliness is the degree to which you can compete in games that require male competencies with other males. Manhood, and let me just sort of uh, collect my thoughts here. Manhood is individual masculinity. This is a man's making manliness his own, okay. right? So certain manliness skills may not translate well into manhood. Yeah. Meaning if you're a really good fighter and you're a really good protector, well, this may sort of cultivate baseline aggressive traits that may not translate very well into your role as father protector. And, and you realize that you have to now cultivate an even more nuanced and more complex skills mm. devoted to your particular family, your particular situation. And now you're pursuing higher level skills, masculine competencies like moral integrity and virtue and emotional regulation. And now these are these higher level things of manhood where now you're talking about taking those basic male skills, which translate into manliness with other men, and then applying them to yourself and making it your own. And what this does is, is manhood is where we can account for what the postmoderns want and their concern as a diversity of men. The individual. Yes, the, the individual. individual aspect. Yeah, yeah. The individual. This is where they like individualism. <laughs> yes, right. The individual aspect of men. But what they don't like is the fact that it's, it's a hierarchy. And what we mm. do with our manhood is built on complex manliness games and manliness skills, which are ultimately rooted in our genotype as men, which are ultimately rooted right. in baseline male competencies. And this comes a bit to this distinction between genotype and phenotype, between the genotype, which is the male, mm -hmm. and the phenotype, which is the manly, is really important for how we distinguish manliness or masculinity from femininity. So we postmoderns want to look at the fact that masculinity is a social construct and say, well, therefore we can reject it and it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. The problem is that people who want to reject it often don't have an appreciation for the operation that these gender norms play for us as individuals and right. in a society. And so what, what happens what, is... What's the analogy that you use in the article? Oh, well, yeah. The <laughs> so, it's such a great... I, I use an analogy of a meatball where it's you, just like... You said like, yeah, a meatball is also... Uh, culturally yeah it's determined. a social construct it's so yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but that meatball has come to have value in our culture it it, it has a relationship right. to certain norms and understandings of mm -hmm. of culinary etiquette or it, creation right exactly Something. certain meatballs are better than other meatballs right yeah, they yeah, taste yeah. better they have better mouthfeel right or whatever it is and it's same thing with masculinity where ultimately okay men have have trans uh, just roll with me here everybody right just mm -hmm. put your brains on like put your podcast on 0 0.5 x right so men have transmitted um uh phenotypical traditions which means that there are there are traditions that we've inherited of how we act as men that have been refined by millennia of war and famine and political volatility and mm -hmm. these have survived this is what all of the lessons of a millennia of generation of men say this is what produces the best men mm. for the occasion, for the culture, for the society, for the nation. And these are not just the baseline male attributes, but the phenotypical manliness skills that we need and that we require and the manhood competencies like bravery and virtue and care and integrity and intelligence. These are all, all of these, each of these categories, male, manly and manhood uh, 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 skills and competencies. We need all of them and is we need these particular ones. Mm -hmm. And postmoderns typically want to throw those away and say, ah, we don't need those. Those are a social construct. It's like, no, they're important to us. They're a gift to us so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. And so that's kind of my definition of masculinity, a man's that's maximization cool. of his own potential for competence in the domains of maleness, manliness, and manhood. And especially, I think it's especially important here to highlight this issue of a maximization of a man's own potential for competence mm. because potential there, I, I've received some feedback before and some criticism where people say where, where, you know, I will, for example, in a context, identify masculinity with 
the pursuit of physical strength, right? And they say, okay, well, my son is it, my son doesn't have use of his legs. So are you saying he's less of a man? No, we have different potentials for competence Ooh. in different areas. He probably has potentials for strength that I'll never be able to attain, and I have certain potentials for strength that he'll never be able to, uh, you know, to use. So actually, what this highlights is it, we can celebrate the diversity of human male potential for competence without having to corrode these notions of maleness and Ooh. manliness and manhood. We and so we can say, okay, we each have different potentials for competence. What makes it masculine? is that we maximize it and that we recognize its competence that we're pursuing. Mm -hmm. And, and once we do that, we can appreciate, okay, yeah, we're all different. Mm -hmm. And then maximization, this is where the rubber really meets the road of human choice. So you don't really have control over your potential for competence. You have a certain ceiling. I have a certain ceiling for my, my competence in, in basketball performance. Whatever my ceiling is, is still lower than LeBron James yeah. just is. And that's a ceiling for it. But at the same time, um, maximization is my choice. So I can either make the most of that or I can make the least of that. And that's huh. where agency comes into masculinity. That's where self formation, the middle voice comes into masculinity, really where I need to be self forming, where even the apostle Paul says that he says, train yourself. He says to Timothy, I think it is. And, and that's what men do is they have to train themselves. Now, do women not train themselves? No, of course they do. Uh, and in fact, these pheno, these like I said, these transmitted, these transmitted phenotypical traditions. But phenotypical, you're saying the cultural, the cultural, yeah. the manliness or the womanliness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you've got the biological, which is the man, the maleness, mm -hmm. the the cultural, which is the manliness, manliness. and the individual, the psychological, which is the manhood, mm -hmm. right? And at that cultural level, that phenotypical level, the male and the female phenotypes or the, the masculine and the feminine phenotypes have evolved side by side and with reference to one another. Yeah. So because it's rooted in the genotype, what are the basic genotypical needs of males and females? Just evolution aside, all that stuff aside, women give birth to children and are vulnerable and need the protection of men who have more muscle than them. So we're going to maximize those competencies. What happens when you maximize a woman's potential for nurture and a man's potential for physical strength, which is what you ought to do because those are the natural given genotypical strengths of those genders, right? Well, men become protectors and women become caregivers. Does that mean what women shouldn't become caregivers? They shouldn't be allowed to, or that men shouldn't be nurturing? No, it just means that this is what's fitting this is the phenotype. These are the cultural standards that are fitting to this biological individual, mm -hmm. which not only is that a creational theology, but it's something that God says explicitly in the Bible. And the fact that it's controversial, I think, is more odd to me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but 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 these phenotypical traditions that we that have been transmitted. Now, what does it look like for a woman to be competent? And if a man is the protector and a woman is the caregiver, does that mean a woman shouldn't? train like a protector does that mean she shouldn't go do deadlifts right no my wife does deadlifts. yeah exactly <laughs> my wife's a beast <laughs> yeah exactly go do it right does that mean women uh, that, that that men shouldn't become good with children no it right. just means that this at the fundamental level this is what's fitting and this is what you ought to pursue that doesn't mean you can't add on to that right but this is what's fitting and this is how that this is this this evolution from the genotype to the phenotype to the psychology this is how the biology governs how behavior ought to work and what mm. cultural expectations we should have of these genders and how we should define them and how we should operationalize them, not just for how we work as a culture, but for how we work as individuals. And once we have this understanding, well, then we can start taking notes on ourselves. We don't have to be so hard on ourselves. We don't have to say, oh, well, am I a man or am I not a man? We can say, okay, what gifts, what gifts do I have? Hmm. What potentials do I have? How can I maximize those potentials? How can I pursue uh, competence in those areas? And how can I make the most of that for myself? Mm -hmm. Which actually, I think, and I don't know if you guys want to get into this later, we, and we can even skip it if you want, but, but it's this, this notion, I think, of being one's own man is really the essence of masculinity. Hmm. And taking responsibility for yourself is the irreducible foundation of what it means to be a man. Mm -hmm. And actually, you get into this in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, when Paul says, he uses this hapax legamenon, this one-time yep. word, andridzisthe, be men, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And he says that right after he charges, or, or, or he explains what Apollos did, for, uh, where he says, I'm just going to read the text real quick, where Paul says, now, Concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. 
Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. And we could unpack that for hours and hours, but I think Apollos represents really interesting uh, case study, an exemplar of masculinity here, where the apostle Paul, this regal, sort of almost, you know, like yeah. celebrity yeah. pastor yeah. comes in and says, Apollos, I need you to come and do this. And he says, no, I have my own mission. He is his own man, so much so that he is not concerned with, uh, uh, with, with appeasing the wishes of another man and is not willing to, 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 to uh, capitulate his mission to somebody else because God has called him and he has owned it for himself and he has faced God authentically and received a calling from God for himself. Now, does that mean that men shouldn't serve and be part of other people's missions and be part of the church and serve God's bigger purpose right, on right, earth? Right. No, but he is on mission and yeah. he is on call and he's going to, he's not going to get taken off task of his mission just because the apostle Paul, this important guy wants him to do something. And having that sense of ownership is extremely, extremely important. Yeah. I think you see that exemplified yeah. in Apollos here. Well, let's, let's do this. We'd like to wrap it up with, mm. um, with some of your thoughts on, uh, communicating the the, 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 as much of a biblical perspective as you can get, yeah. because honestly, like I don't, when, when I'm reading the Bible, uh, I, I don't find an emphasis on masculinity. I find yeah. an emphasis on godliness, mm -hmm. right? And so the vast majority of that is, is it transfers across gender. Yeah, right. Um, but the Bible does say something here. And so um, I love your breakdown. Um, I, I love maleness, manliness, manhood, the maximization of, of potential. I think that's really, really helpful. But I know a lot of our people right now might be feeling a bit overwhelmed, mm. and they're going to have to go and read the article, and they're going to have to listen to this again. I hope you'll listen to this again. You should be going to uh, selfwire.org and, and read Paul's stuff. I hope you get a podcast going on in this issue yeah, it's because be there. Uh, it's, I think it's going to blow up. But just share with us and, and some of our listeners what, what the Bible really does say about this. What, what are some, some theological, biblical truths that we can take with us as we're considering this issue of masculinity? Yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, uh, so when you get into the gender norms that Scripture prescribes, um, there is a clear, implicit framework in which uh, uh, men and women share in certain responsibilities, but there is a domestic agreement with which Paul basically concurs that women are caretakers in the house and that men have certain baseline physical and manly, uh, uh, um, uh, what's the term I'm looking for, obligations that they mm. must fulfill. And so what the challenges that we face in the church in 2018 are going to be drawing and dealing more with this manhood category of psychology uh, especially in terms of gen a gender specific understanding of those things than Paul, who in that time was dealing more with these basic male and manliness competencies yeah, where yeah. you're talking more about the competition of different tribes within the church, egos getting involved. And, and like you said, Joe, that there is no particular quality, a positive quality that we could say, well, this is a male quality strength, it's right? A male quality, nurture is a female quality. It's like, we've kind of unpacked, how we could say that in a way that's true, yeah. that these are fitting attributes of people of these certain genders, but virtue is virtue. Godliness is godliness, right? And yet, on the other hand, what you have is really maleness as a metaphor for certain qualities, right? So like Jordan Peterson talks about mm. this a little bit, right? Where it's like, it, uh, uh, where there's this notion of, okay, physical strength, take that for example, right? Where a, a, uh, is it possible that a woman could be stronger than a man? Of course. Oh, there yeah. are many. You see this a, a lot. All yeah, the time. Michelle beats me up all the time. Exactly. Right, right, right. But when you take the 100 strongest people in the world, they are all men. Right. And in that sense, strength is a masculine metaphor. And so when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be strong, act, act like, like men, man, yeah. what he's saying is be the strongest of the strong. When you think of a man doing his job, you're thinking of these soldiers out there on the battlefield, the 300 sort of picture of these men going to war, right? And and even women can be inspired by that. In sure. the same way that men can be inspired by, you know, yeah. f female or, or women, uh, you know, uh, embodying attributes that are fitting to them in ways that mm -hmm. men can't do in, in as excellent of a way. Mm -hmm. And so, and so when and Paul, Paul talks about that, right? He's like, uh, how tender we were towards you like a nursing mother, right? There you he go. takes that metaphor exactly. and runs with it. And in that sense... 
Paul, when Paul says here, be men, women can take this charge yeah, to themselves absolutely. and take responsibility and be watchful and stand firm in the mm-hmm. faith and be strong and act like men in a sense. And what he's really saying is like, I embody this ideal which is excellent in your own lives for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of your relationship with God and for the That's sake good. of the church. Likewise, I just want to highlight it. So, so, so I want to highlight on the one hand that second, this thing, this notion of Apollos exemplifying manliness in a way in which that is a little out of joint with Paul's mission in the church mm. where he has his own calling from God. It's not his own agenda against the church, but it's own calling from God. And men must find their calling from God and be on that mission with conviction. And that is mm-hmm. really essential for manliness. That is extremely essential for masculinity. So vocation, really, this is another issue, but you're saying vocation is a critically important issue yes. for and, manliness. And that comes back to this more, I think, the really core of the Bible's conception of masculinity here comes back to Jacob comes back to Israel, where there's actually a really good book, uh, a University of Chicago Press by a guy named Dove Weiss called uh, um, Protest. I'm not, I'll, I'll get you guys the link to the book, yeah. but it's about the, 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 the tradition of rabbinic and Christian um, uh, uh, theologies of protest reading protest scriptures in the Bible Mm. and applying them to early medieval contexts, so 2nd century to 7th century, and how Christians and Jews were fighting about, is it appropriate to protest God? And there was this rabbinic Jewish tradition that was pro-protest, and most of the Christian readings actually were very Mm anti-protest, where, where, for example, reading Exodus 5, where Moses says, (sighs) Moses says to God, why have you done evil to your people? And in Habakkuk and in Job, where these guys, they bring this brazen affront to God and they say, why have you done evil? Right. And, and Augustine, he reads these passages saying, you know, they're just inquire, they're just setting God up to Mm. tee off. Like they know that God hasn't done evil, but the rabbis are saying, no, they were doing battle with God. They were going to war with God. And in some of these Jewish liturgies, some of the liturgy would actually as- uh, 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 ascend the rabbi into battle with God, not as an affront to him, but as an assumption of his character, saying, calling to God on his word, saying, be holy because you are holy. Mm. And and um, this, this, uh, uh, um, this protest tradition, I think it, it exemplifies Israel. Which is which means you know to wrestle with God, right? And this name that God gives His people, His chosen people, is those who wrestle with Me. Mm. And it's really important that a man can ultimately go face to face with God, not in a way where you always have to be fighting with God or always have yeah. to be protesting against Him, but just in a way where you're going toe to toe, you're going face to face. You know, maybe you'll be eviscerated, but it's you. And mm-hmm. this is this Kierkegaardian sense of at the end of the day. It's a man, I forget who it's, I think it was Hudson Taylor said this, a man is who he is on his knees before God and no more. That's what a man is. And I think that that has real anthropological and psychological truth for there's us. There's transparency, there's an openness. Yes. There's, yeah. I don't care about my status. And honesty. Yeah, I don't care about my status in church right now. I don't care about my status in anything else right now. It's me and you. Let's go. Let's do this. It's such a beautiful picture, right? Yes. It's a, it's a right. picture that you see in the gospel, like calling us to this relationship with our God. And that's yes. kind of what you're really kind of pushing us towards is this mm-hmm. real communion with God. Yes. A real communion, a vulnerable communion, one in which moral imperfection can be dealt with mm-hmm. and named and repented from and moved on from, yeah. but can also come again. Proverbs says a wise man falls down seven times, but gets back up again. A fool stumbles in times of calamity. Mm. And so in a sense, again, you guys can cut this out if you want to. No, probably not. What does it mean to be foolish? It means life makes you its and you stay down. Mm. What does a man do? He gets up again. Mm. And he just gets up again. It doesn't say a wise man doesn't fall. Right. But we pretend like that has to be the case. Where we keep on getting back up again and going before the face of God. And repenting. And do and doing battle with him. And saying, hey, how could you let this happen? And having that unencumbered relationship with God. Guided by a tradition of, 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 of awe and of protest. Directed toward God who is holy and mysterious. And we bring both of those things to him and we say, call us, give us a mission, help us to do something. Mm-hmm. That's what masculinity is for us. And we have to appropriate that. And it's complex as we've seen here today. But at the end of the day, I think that's the core. Going toe to toe with God and saying, let's roll. And, and for me, that's something I've had to learn to do in an evangelical culture that's made really incentivized me to play by certain rules in my public speech about God that 
I found to be not speaking the full truth. And, uh, and, and I think that scripture and the Christian tradition and the interpretive tradition relative to scripture gives us such a rich pool of resources with which we can relate to God. And I don't think we utilize all of those. And I think that that kind of hinders our spiritual masculinity a mm. little bit. So, well, that's really, really helpful. There's so much for us to think about here. And um, a great place for our listeners to start is to go to selfwire.org. Mm-hmm. Um, right on the front page, at least at this point, is the mm-hmm. crisis of masculinity in a postmodern age. So we want to che- check that out. We'll yeah. have a link to it in the show notes. You can also go to theo.fit as well uh, if you're looking to, to get into shape, to take uh, you know, physical health uh, more seriously. Uh, Paul has some great resources there. Yeah, how can people find you online? Yeah, it's Twitter, Paul C. Maxwell, Instagram, Paul C. Maxwell. You find me on Facebook. Wait, uh, wait so it's just, it's just Paul oh, stop C. It. Maxwell? Stop it. There's what? no numbers in there. What's that? You don't have no numbers? <laughs> what? Like, like Paul underscore 63 underscore Maxwell. You don't do that. Why? Who well, does because, that? Well, I don't oh, know, Jimmy. Jimmy. Don't, <laughs> who does that? <laughs> I don't have an <laughs> underscore. dumb numbers in I there. I have no underscore. Oh, my it's gosh. It's because the guy that has Jim or Jimmy Fowler is from Canada, from Ontario, and he hasn't used it since 2007. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Canadians don't use it. Ridiculous. Canadians. They, don't, they don't even use their, they don't even use the nature up there. You know how many, yeah. like, awesome, like, skyscrapers they can be oh, building goodness, up there? Stop it. How many oil fields they could have? <laughs> they don't know how to use what they got. <laughs> They're all in Alberta. <laughs> Listen, uh, um, Paul C. Maxwell, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah. That's where people are going to find you. Um, and get that podcast going, man. I will. Yeah, we I need... shall. All right. Uh, do you know when this is going to drop? Next Thursday. Next yeah. Thursday? I'll yeah. have it up before then. All right, cool. Yeah. Sweet. So we'll, we'll link to everything. Send us a link to that book you can't remember the name I of. I will. Uh, and we'll get everything linked up. So, Joe, we've got something coming up May 3rd oh and 4th. Gosh, you want to talk about this? So we've got to talk good. about it for just a moment. Listen, uh, you can register. Paul might be there. He might show oh, up. Paul better sure. be there. Doctor Devotion Conference. Doctor Devotion Conference. Biblical. We can only theo- afford either you or Phil. <laughs> and because Phil had, you know, Jasmine. Jasmine. We really wanted Jasmine. Yeah, yeah. two for one. Yeah. But once we get to know you. Molly, your wife. Oh yeah. Then, then yeah, yeah. Then oh, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll bring you. Up then too. we'll bring you through her. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so the, the 2019 conference is Biblical Theology: The Revelation of God's Person, Plan, and Purpose. This is done in partnership with Zondervan. We love Zondervan. Uh, they're they're backing us, and not just for the podcast, but for the conference. Premier per- partner. Premier partner. They're promoting the Biblical Theology Study Bible. Uh, our plenary speaker is Dr. Jim Hamilton. Oh. You guys know him. What is Biblical Theology uh, and so on. He's written a bunch of stuff, a professor at Southern. Uh, then you've got uh, Joe Thorne and Jimmy Fowler. we got a bunch of breakout speakers, oh, though. Man. Phil and uh, Jasmine. Phil and Jasmine. Steve McCoy, Nick Batzig, Doug Logan, my wife, Jen Thorne. Um, it's going to be a good time. You can register now. Early Bird is 79 bucks for oh. these two days. Uh, yep. And there's only a certain number of those. Yeah. Yeah, we're not doing it till a certain date. It's there's only a few, you know. Yeah, seating is limited, so yeah. we're we're just trying to balance things out. That's right. Uh student rate 59 bucks. Yep. So you don't get the t-shirt, so don't yeah, complain. Yeah. Yeah. So you know what? Or any other swag. If nope. we get swag. <laughs> Listen, uh just let me let's, let me just tell you some of the plenary sessions, okay? Go ahead, go for it. All right. How to connect theology with experience? Oh, that's you and I. Yeah, you and we're, I are we're doing, doing that. that. We're doing that at the beginning. Yep. The theologian's mission. Oh yeah. Introduction to biblical theology. Oh, biblical yeah. theology and discipleship. Mm. Biblical theology and typology. Yep. Biblical theology and worship. Yep. Biblical theology in the church. Oh. Biblical theology and podcasting. They, no, we're not. Doing no, that's that. not one. Well, well, are right. we going to record a podcast? Yeah, we're going to record. Yeah, we got it. It's part of the schedule. Yeah, I think people yeah. we'll like that. And we got breakout sessions on marriage, suffering, parenting, preaching, and mission, all related to oh, biblical theology. You guys need to go good. to doctrineindevotion dot com slash conference and register. Get this thing going because it's every year it grows and it's we're going to run out of spe- seating is limited. So seating is limited. So get in yeah, on it. You want to get in on hashtag Doc and Devo nineteen. So Joe. If people want to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, where do they go? Why are you asking me? That's your thing. You talk about it. I know, because it. I, I kind of led into it. At and Doc I, and Devo, Twitter, Instagram, there you go. Facebook, Facebook, slash Doctrine, Doctrine and Devotion. Devotion. What are you asking me or are you telling me? I'm kind of helping you, okay, so I can I take over now and okay, go. go ahead. You can follow us online. Dang it, I just did it. I, yeah. I was going through my thing. This, this is like the longest exit ever. I know. <laughs> DrDevotion.com, there you can sign up for the email blast where you can get the Ransom Bible Study Method oh. if you sign up for the email blast. RansomBibleStudyMethod.com. There you go. You could uh, grab some gear, send us uh, an email. And money. And Wait, no. That's, no. Well, yeah. that's if we grab the gear. Yeah. Send First us money every Monday and Thursday blog posts on Wednesday. Well, money, Video too. content on Fridays later. pay for this conference. It's like $50,000. <laughs> <laughs>